Uh, as we look at agriculture financing for the future, there are plans being laid for us, and we must recognize our relationship with government and the plans which they are discussing openly with us today. Now, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you your national vice president, who will deliver to you a message this afternoon, outlining, I'm sure, that relationship between you and your organization, you and the government and your responsibilities uh, contingent on each other. Some background. Bob is a farm boy. He was born and raised in Redwood County, Minnesota. He served three years in the U.S. Army, and at the age of 21, Bob was attached to the American training team, which was a newly formed group, particularly the group that they were training, which was a newly formed German military organization on U.S. weapons and military strategy. And he taught there in that course for some period of time. Upon his discharge, he returned to Minnesota, began farming in 1959. He presently farms 700 acres in Yellow Medicine County, and he and his wife have two sons, Robert and Preston. Bob became a member of NFO in 1962, became a staff organizer, became a county president, worked in the field staff department. He organized in Minnesota, South Dakota, and Iowa. He worked as a state coordinator during the 1964 meat holding action and also as a coordinator in the 1967 dairy holding action. He served as president of Minnesota's 6th district and four years as president of the state of Minnesota. He has served eight years as a member of the National Board of Directors. In July 1974, he was elected by the National Board as acting vice president. And in the convention of 1979, he was elected by the delegates as the vice president of the organization. And it becomes his responsibility to represent the president out in the country when scheduling becomes difficult and conflicts arise. And Bob has filled that role well. And so I introduce to you your national vice president, Bob Art. Bob. Thank you, Devon. You know, uh, those of you who are here and probably witnessing the National Farmers Organization in action for the first time, the news media or perhaps the visitors, I want to assure you that, uh, as you probably already have seen, uh, NFO members go through a lot of effort going to NFO meetings. You know, I've heard horror stories about getting to an NFO meeting, but I think all of them that I heard uh, this weekend uh, beat them all. And there's a lot of them. Well, fellow delegates, members of the National Farmers Organization, you are to be commended, and certainly I want to congratulate you for accepting the challenge of establishing a new order in agriculture. You know, while politicians and economists, professors and educated men and women have given a lot of lip service and have written many documents about the economic chaos in our economy and in agriculture, you and the membership of this organization have stood fast and remained steadfast in building a nationwide collection, collective bargaining organization that has been able to give hope to agriculture through the periods of time, through very dark days uh, in the past decade or so. You've not been taken in by people who say that you should be there and take handouts. You've never been dulled or humbled by those who say that they take care of you you're commended for that. You've established not only the only rely, uh, you've established the only uh, line of resistance to the adversaries that we have in agriculture today. You had not only have established the only line of resistance, but you have together 
driven deep into the midst of the opposition that would drive free enterprise system from the land. You've established a system that has been able to give the young farmer and rancher of this nation and those that have backed their venture into agriculture the hope that they will be able to extract from the marketplace enough profit to pay their bills and retire debt. And I want to express to you my appreciation for having the opportunity to serve you and this organization across this great country. You know, it's a good feeling to know that we're right. It's a good feeling to know that already 20 years ago we've expressed the conditions that we're seeing today in this industry. While organizations can only talk about the problems in agriculture and then dispose of their discussions for political expediency, while politicians and economists have debated about how they're going to correct the economic chaos in this country, we've remained steadfast and persistent and on track. We've entrenched the plan of nationwide collective bargaining deep into the roots and heritage of this land. We're no longer getting the opposition or resistance from young farmers and ranchers. We are getting farm groups, farm organizations to respect this organization and not only respect it, but those of whom that we have met with and talked with are not only giving us moral support, but are asking their membership to take a look at the National Farmers Organization and are encouraging their people to join us and participate in our programs. Well, we've made a lot of inroads over the past several years in this area, but we've only just begun. You know, as I go across this great nation of ours, I've witnessed more confusion among farmers and ranchers and rural business people than I have as long as I've been associated with this industry. And I'm sure you have too. And it hasn't happened by accident. You can go back 20, 30 years, in the 1950s and 1960s when we were told to become more efficient, expand your debt, expand your farming operations, consume each other. That's when the confusion began, because we listened to them. We expanded our credit, our debt. We became more efficient. We consumed each other. And as we consumed each other, it became very evident that those were not the answers to our problems, that it was a trap. But we didn't know what to do about it. We revolted. We put up a fuss. But then they came out with a new cry. They said, now that you people have become efficient, you've expanded your credit, your debt, you've produced too much. You've got a surplus. Surplus was the cry. They said that we've got to find more exports, get rid of that surplus that we're producing. Our federal economic planners and policymakers went to great lengths to convince the American public that, and the, and the farmers and ranchers, that we've got too much and that the USDA must intervene. They must intervene so that agriculture and overproductive agriculture can be supported. And the hoax had its effect. You've lived through the times. They said we need to export more commodities. We increased our exports by 700%. In 10 years time, did it help? No, you know it didn't help. Why? Because we dumped our commodities into the marketing system without thought of pricing them. You know, I got a son 18 years old now, but when he was 13 years old, I remember him coming back from school, from high school. He said, Dad, he said, we learned in, about the balance of trade today in school, and he's got a question that he wanted to ask me. So I asked him what it was. 
He said, how come that if we got a country as great as ours and we sell so much commodities or so much product into the world markets that our teacher told us that we are, have a deficit trade balance? Well, I told him that one of the reasons why, I think, is because the, a lot of the commodities that we're selling into the world markets are grain. And that we're selling a dollar's worth of grain uh, into the world markets for about 65 cents. And we're losing 35 cents for every dollar's worth of grain that we sell into the world markets. And he's 13 years old. You know what he said? He said, well, that's dumb. I told him, yeah, it was dumb, but we're working on it. You know, doing business that way just doesn't affect you and I, or the people of this country. When I visited with the Director of Economic Affairs of Underdeveloped Countries at the United Nations a couple of years ago, he pointed out some very key facts that I think you and I need to recognize in the people of this country. He said, you know, that it's a common belief that underdeveloped countries are attempting to get their agriculture going, and that we're encouraging those countries to develop their agriculture because we believe that they need to feed themselves. He said that's one reason. He said it's, they need to feed themselves, but it's not the primary reason. He said the real reason that the underdevelopment countries need to develop their agriculture is so that they can get for themselves an economic base in which they can increase their economic, better their economic conditions. But he said, you know what? They've got a problem. He says it costs them to produce food and fiber in their land just like it does here. He said their basic problem is that they must compete with the cheap labor in America, in America's farm sector. Now that struck home pretty hard. You know who he was talking about? You and I. Underdeveloped countries, third world nations, had to compete with yours and my cheap labor in agriculture. He said, because the United States then dumps their product into a world market, causes a depressed prices because of the volume they have to dump, and the third world countries who have a meager amount to export to gain some economic base cannot extract enough money out of the world market to increase their economic conditions. He said, that's a problem. And he said, if the American foreign policy in the agricultural sector continues, the export policies continue, he said, we're going to continue to see unfriendly attitudes of third world countries toward this nation. Well, I can tell you that I had mixed feelings when I left that visit. On one hand, I recognize that I'm one of the cheap sources of labor in this country because I'm one of the agriculture producers. But I was competing against third world countries that I thought were underdeveloped. No better off. And on the other hand, I recognized a tremendous responsibility that I had and a pride in that I belonged to an organization that could do something about it. Not only about the conditions of myself, but about conditions of this country and perhaps conditions in international affairs. Well, there's a lot of cheap food policy and policy makers in this country. Who are they? Who are the people that plan for cheap food policies? I want to ask you, do you remember the CED programs of the 1960s? How many of you remember the CED plan? You know, some of you have been around a while. Well, just very shortly, I want to go over what the Committee for Economic Development, the CED report, said. Remember what they said? They said there's not enough income going into agriculture 
to support six million farmers. So they made a recommendation to Congress. You know what the recommendation was? Did they recommend that we increase the income going into agriculture? No. They recommended that we decrease the number of human resources get them out of agriculture and leave the amount of income basically the same so that the amount of money going into agriculture would be shared by fewer people. And those fewer people then would have the ability to have as good a standard of living as those outside of agriculture. Makes sense, doesn't it? The one thing they ignored was the economic impact on the industry. And more important, they ignored the human impact of suffering in their displacement. Remember Herb Stein? Who knows the name Herb Stein? You ought to all have heard it because your president, Devon Woodland, mentioned it a few times in the past couple of months. Herb Stein was one of the authors of the CED report of the early 1960s. Thought he went away, didn't you? Well, he stuck his head up again a couple of months ago when Devon Woodland was asked to go to a summit meeting of agricultural leaders in Washington. Meeting with these leaders and Secretary of Agriculture John Block. Herb Stein gave a report to that meeting. He said that there needs to be further reductions in human resources in agriculture. When Devon asked him how many more, he didn't say. He didn't say where it would end. Now, it's hard to believe that he could sucker anybody into believing that theory anymore, isn't it? Well, he suckered one more. The Secretary of Agriculture, John Block, bought it. Following that summit meeting, his department came out and echoed the very theory of Herb Stein and that we need further reduction in human resources and we can expect to get further reduction in human resources. Believe it or not. Now when the chief administrator of federal, federal farm policy says that we must accept the fact that farmers and ranchers must go I question his motives, and I question the direction he's attempting to take this industry. And I, for one, if there is anyone here that will take the message back to him, tell him I don't like it. And tell them that we don't have any inefficient resources left to go. And that we plan to stay. Well, they expect to succeed in their plans. They've got at their disposal all of the tools they need to keep farmers and ranchers confused. They've got the news, the farm media, the farm news publications, grain trade, the meat trade, economists, marketing analysts, the old political football game. These are at their disposal, and it's time that you and I encourage our fellow members to question these sources of information and ask that our federal members sort out the shaft from the grain the propaganda from fact, then you and I take the responsibility that each of us have and present to them the facts. Present to them the membership agreement. Ask them to become part of this organization that you and I have built so that we could overcome the deception and the misleading of Americans' food and fiber industry. 
Well, enough for the bad news. And there's plenty of it out there. But you know what? There's good news in agriculture. And the good news is this, that the National Farmers Organization is alive and well. Mid-Am and AMPI knows it is. John Block and Herb Stein knows we're alive and well. Those young dairy producers out there know that we're alive and well. They've been seen and contacted many times these past several months. The National Pork Producers Association knows it. The analysts in predicting lower hog prices know it. I'll tell you what, tomorrow when you go to the grain meeting and listen to the plans the grain department has and after you carry through the grain trade and this nation's going to know it. <laughs> the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, I understand that you're here today. You know it. Minnesota Farmers Union. American Ag Leaders becoming involved in our programs. you probably hear more about that at the grain department too tomorrow at the meeting. How many of you know that marketing analysts who's been in the business for years and some of them for decades have been frequently contacting your departments at the home office so that they can get an insight on future trends of what's going on in agriculture because they recognize the accuracy of your organization. Didn't know that, did you? We don't give much information, but they keep on asking us. These are things that are happening, I think, behind the scenes that we don't see happening from day-to-day -day basis, from day-to-day. -day. But it helps to build a total collective bargaining effort that you and I have put into this organization for the past 22 years. And it's there. We've made a lot of inroads. And we've gained a lot of respect from other organizations, from the political arena. And I'll tell you what, we need all the allies we can get. But I say this to you delegates today, that the battle for the control of this industry is going to be fought in the trenches in the country on your farms. And that battle is going to be fought with food and fiber as the weapons. The battle lines have been drawn. The adversaries have been determined. On one side is the National Farmers Organization and the private free enterprise system and those that believe in it. On the other hand are the greedy that will use outside investments to consume the liquidated assets of the free enterprise system and the cheap food policy makers of this country. The battle lines are drawn, and you and I, whether we like it or not, are in the middle of it. We're either going to lead in it and get our fellow farmers to partake in our effort to win that battle, because there's a $250 billion industry at stake, and the winner is going to take it. The decisions we make as leaders of this organization is going to have far-reaching results, not only with this organization, not only with your farming operations, but with an industry, the most powerful industry in the world, the food and fiber industry of this country. It's going to take leadership at every level. It's going to take leadership where the battle is going to be fought right out there in the country. There are many forces that affect agriculture. You've got the forces of agriculture commodity inputs, the availability of credit. You've got the force of government programs. But I tell you, there is no force in agriculture as powerful as the force of your production.
the food and fiber that you own and you control. And you are going to make the final decision how that force is going to be used. Is it going to be used to build our power block of bargaining strength? Or is it going to be used to aid our adversaries in their plan for agriculture? And not only your production, but how much leadership are you going to give to your neighbor down the road, that young new producer that just started farming a few years ago, and getting him to use his production to assist the strength of collective bargaining, and point out to him that his production is going to be used either to destroy his industry and turn it over to the adversary, or it's going to be used to build a block of commodity so large that the industry cannot afford to turn their back on it, but must negotiate before they get it. That's where your leadership comes in, yours and mine. That's the real issue, and that's where the battle is going to be fought at that level. That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. What are we going to do? with that food and fiber we own and control before we liquidate it. You know, it's our heritage to stand proud, firm, and unafraid, and to let the world know that we intend to stay entrenched in the soil, and that they are not going to dig us out and that we're going to use our determination and leadership to stay here and to exercise our right to price our products and then carry through. <laughs> we've walked into the midst of our adversaries and we've laid down a new order, never forget it, a new system that we call the Nationwide Collective Bargaining for Agriculture System of, for Agriculture, Nationwide Collection Dispatch and Delivery System, laid it out in the middle of the old marketing system, a system that's built by farmers and ranchers and it's controlled by farmers and ranchers for the benefit of farmers and ranchers. And it's a system that will give the citizens of this industry the ability to extract enough profit from the marketplace to pay their bills and retire debt. Those young men and women and those who have been, who backed their venture into agriculture, give them hope and support. They no, 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 they no longer need to be humbled or coerced into seeking handouts. That's what you put together. Folks, that's what we're going to maintain. Those of who cry for cheap food policies, who hide behind the law of supply and demand from behind closed doors, let's draw them out in the open. Let's bring them out onto our territory so that we can deal with them from a point of strength. You know that their surplus hoax is exposed. Their law of supply and demand has been tested, and it has not stood up. You and I have the inventory of food and fiber in this country first, and we own it. And that inventory of food and fiber is in our favor. Do you realize that we produce half of the corn produced in the world? We've got it in our hands. First owners, 60% of the world's soybeans that we supply the world market with half of its wheat and we can't price it? And we throw the coarse grains into, with the wheat, we supply the world market with over 60% of its needs that it buys and imports, you and I. We don't have a surplus. We control the inventory of the merit of the world's food and fiber. You know that we've got to import 
four times as much red meat as we export just to keep the people in this nation fed, that we've got to import and have been importing three times as much dairy products as we've been exporting. I don't know what they're doing with it. They might be piling it up and making it look like we got a surplus, so that we got to pay for it out of our pocket. But I'll tell you what, if we're doing it, we're letting them do it. Because the inventory of food and fiber is in our favor. It's a matter of organizing our sales through our nationwide collective bargaining and marketing sales structure. Well, how do we do it? How do we put ourselves into a position to use the food and fiber, that weapon that we have, to stop the adversaries from destroying the very roots and foundation of this organization and this industry? I think the first thing we've got to recognize is this, and that is this organization has three basic elements of resources. We've got the people, the producers, the farmers, the ranchers, the leaders.